All right, we got Dr. Student and little boy Venema talking here about things we know nothing about. Now, let's talk about uh, 240, the course is compression, and the date is November 6th. I believe it's midterm election day, too. At any rate, we are talking about Unit 7. We finished Unit 6 last week. And last week, we covered digital noise reduction, various types of digital noise reduction. We talked about how phase cancellation is used in headphones, why that doesn't work in hearing aids. We talked about spectral subtraction, spectral enhancement, and we even talked about amplitude modulation and how digital noise reduction works in hearing aids. And without going to that unit at all, I'll just verbalize it generally. Speech, as I'm talking right now, is a weird stimulus. And it's best if you kind of think about a language you don't understand. So I'll talk in uh, German. Der Papst hat steckt Spotstelt. Or Nihango de Hanashmaska, Doye Tashmaste. When you think about the sounds of speech, it's the stat, I've got itchy ear. That's the nature of speech. When you talk about noise, usually it's continuous. So the, the noise of a fan, or the noise of an air conditioner, or even the noise of background cocktail party chatter. It's kind of like, whereas the sound of my flapping gums right here is, so it's the staccato, choppy, changing nature that makes speech unique. And we'll say in one sentence, its intensity changes rapidly over time, whereas noise doesn't. So the, the way the sound waveform of noise will stay like this, and the sound of speech will kind of really be choppy. And that's how digital noise reduction in hearing aids works. The microphone picks up the sound, and the artificial intelligence inside the hearing aid is going, hmm, is that sound choppy or is it steady? Angela. You have a hand up. Yes, I had a question about that. If you have someone with a very monotone voice. It won't, no, it won't make any difference. You know okay, why? Still... Because even someone with a monotone voice is still changing the intensity. It's You still have that choppiness. Okay. I get it, though. Good question. Yeah, monotone people, you should shut them out like noise anyway. <laughs> no, so, but speech is a very unique signal. And that's why I say dogs and cats must be laughing their heads off at us because we're standing here up on two legs making barking noises with our mouths. And we're not just making meow or bark. We're so the artificial intelligence in a hearing aid is going, hmm, is that sound changing? Ooh, it must be speech. Now, sometimes the hearing aids make a mistake because sometimes some noises is choppy. You might get noises that are ch -ch 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 like tools, some type of... Uh, and the hearing aid's going to think that speech. So the artificial intelligence isn't always right. Sometimes it makes mistakes. And you want that turned off when you're listening to, no, to music. Because sometimes music has a, nah, it stays in one intensity for a while, and the hearing aid's going to think it's noise. And it's going to become quiet when actually you want to hear it. So it isn't perfect, but the way it generally works is if the noise stays steady in intensity, the hearing aid goes, it's noise. If the sound changes rapidly, the hearing aid thinks speech. Amplify it. If the noise is steady, noise, don't amplify it. So that's what we talked about last week. Now we're going to flip things over and look on a different side. Instead of digital noise reduction, we're going to look at directional microphones. Now, both digital noise reduction and directional microphones deal with trying to increase signal to noise ratio. Remember the twofold goal of hearing aids. One goal is to amplify, duh. The other goal is to make the speech louder than the noise. Now, why do we need to make the speech louder than the noise? Because the cochlea can no longer separate the two because we've got hearing loss. So now let's go into share screen where we can look at a particular PowerPoint slide that highlights this. Here we go. Speech and noise plus hearing aids equals problems in noise. 
Read that again. Speech and noise plus hearing aids equals problems and noise. How come? Two things we've got to do for hearing loss. One, improve audibility. That's kind of the duh, that's gain, that's compression. Number two is something that gain and compression doesn't address, and that's improving signal to noise ratio. In other words, the speech compared to the noise. Think of speech as the signal, okay? And we all know these guys, the US side of the Niagara Falls and the Canadian side of the Niagara Falls, okay? So you've got the inner and the outer hair cells. Look at these outer hair cells being normal. You can see the, the hairs and the test tubes below. With damage, you've not only lost the hairs, but the test tubes have gone. Okay? And that is why we always say perfect hearing looks like this, impaired hearing looks like this. Hearing aids, they don't grow new hair cells. As you all know from anatomy, and as we've all said a thousand times, outer hair cells do two things. They amplify the wave, and they sharpen the traveling wave, the action that's taking place inside the cochlea. We can imitate the first one with WDRC. We can amplify soft sounds that are, look at the black and triangle area. This is what's happening inside the cochlea due to the action of the outer hair cells, and it mainly takes place with soft sounds coming in. Because we all recall, we can't hear sounds where the, outer, the inner hair cells cannot pick up sounds below 50 dB. They need the outers to do that. And that's what WDRC compression was, right? Low knee point, low ratio. It focuses the floor, amplifying soft sounds. Most gain is provided for sounds below the knee point, from zero, say, up to about 40. And then, the, then compression kicks in, and it slowly decreases the gain. Well, Okay, that's why I said in sentence number one, we can imitate the first goal with WDRC. In other words, we can, we can seek to do this for soft sounds. And what do I mean by that? We can lift the traveling wave, we can make it bigger, we can focus our amplification on soft inputs, but we can't do this one. We can't sharpen the wave. We cannot do the second goal. We can only increase the signal to noise ratio. So think about it this way. You've got a waterfall. Have you ever been to Niagara Falls? Okay, let me talk to you because we've got time, okay? As you say, we're ahead. So we've got time to kind of like chill and kind of tell stories here. Now, in Canada and New York State, the, what, the, along the border is a, is a Niagara Falls. It's a river that all of a sudden drops like 250 feet. So you got these huge waterfalls. And the river where the falls is in connects two of the Great Lakes. You have five Great Lakes. Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. Lake Erie and Lake Ontario are round lakes like this, but they are once higher than the other. And Niagara Falls is in between them. The river leaving Lake Erie drops 250 feet in order to continue on to Lake Ontario. So if boats wanted to come in delivering wheat or bringing things inland, you can't go up the falls, and nor can you go down the falls. Those who try usually die. Okay? So, instead of dropping 250 feet, that's the broken river. It's busted. So you have to work around the problem. And what they do is they make a series of locks. Now, I'll draw this just for fun. The boat will be sitting there in the water. The boat will be sitting there in water. And then what they do is they lower it. And here's the boat sitting in the water again. And then they lower it again. So the boat is like sitting in a great big cup of water. 
and that, whoops, I'll show it to you again. And that cup of water is, it's like stair steps. That's what they're doing. The boat is going downstairs. It's going, it's here, and then that, that locks up, and then it drops. Then the boat sails to the next one, and it drops, sails to the next one, drops. And that's how you get around the Niagara Falls. Okay, so the boats use a series of locks and they go parallel to the river, but they don't have to go down the falls. So think about that with the hair cells of the cochlea. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and men couldn't put Humpty together again. The cochlea is broken. We can't grow new hair cells. So think about that like the Niagara Falls. And now think about increasing signal to noise ratio as the locks that the boat goes down. I can't fix the problem, so let's go around the problem. I can't fix it. I can't grow new hair cells. So instead of doing that, which is impossible, why don't I make the speech louder than the noise? Because if I can increase the signal to noise ratio, then the guy with the damaged cochlea can, C-A-N, can separate. Okay? So a normal hearing person in a loud bar, yep, we have problems hearing speech and noise. Sure, it's harder. But hearing loss in that situation, they're gone. You and I will strain a bit, but they're gone. Okay, because they have a damaged cochlea, damaged hair cells, and they cannot separate frequencies close together. They have the Niagara Falls. It's broken. The earth is broken. The cochlea hair cells are busted. So we can't fix that. So let's deliberately make speech louder than the noise so that it is easier for the guy to separate it. Now, digital noise reduction, we said last week, doesn't do that. We can't. It doesn't work. It, it makes you feel better in noise. Remember that? If you, it, it, it makes you feel more comfortable in noise. And that's a good thing because then the guy's going to at least wear his hearing aids. They're not going to be stuck in a drawer. So digital noise reduction has a really important role, a good role. But remember, it's the heart. It's the art. It's, it's, it's not factual percent statistical improvement of speech understanding and background noise. Okay, digital noise reduction does not help that way. It makes you feel better. So it addresses the heart, and that's half a person. Now we've got to address the head. And what addresses the head is directional mics. So you've got an objective thing and a subjective thing. The objective is directional microphones. The subjective is digital noise reduction. Both of those are addressing the signal to noise ratio problem. Good. Now, this has been my long-winded introduction to this unit because we are ahead of time and we can afford it. So let's spend our cash. All right, good. So here's the person, normal hearing, yep, he's got a sharpened traveling waves. He can distinguish between frequencies close together. He's got active normal outer hair cells. All good, God's in his heaven and all's well with the world. But now look at this person here, hearing two frequencies close together. He's got two peaks he can separate. So he's got two of these guys. One here and one here. The frequencies are close together, and guess what? He can still separate them. No problem. Okay? But now look at the middle panel. He's lost outer hair cells. So two things have happened. One, the peaks are smaller, and two, they're more rounded. So if you take, now look at the bottom panel, and you take hearing aids and put them on that person, you're making the small, dull, rounded traveling wave into a larger, dull, rounded traveling wave. And this is better than this, but this ain't that, okay? This isn't coming back. It's gone for good. So all we can do is, again, increase the signal-to-noise ratio so that the person can separate the frequencies close together. That would be the general issue. Hearing aids alone 
tend to make soft compromised sound into louder compromised sound. And this is better than this, but it ain't perfect hearing. So today we have two solutions in noise presently. One's directional microphones, which objectively improve speech and noise performance. And we have digital noise reduction, which subjectively enhances listening comfort in noise. And that has been the issue. So noise reduction implementation is fraught with flaws. You know, it, sounds, it sounds almost British. The implementation is fraught with flaws. Eh? You can't fix it. You can't write. Okay, easier said than done. So look at this crowd of people. I mean, look at these people. And you got just a mass of people. How are you going to get rid of the noise without getting rid of the speech? The problem is that speech and noise are mixed together. So and it ain't easy to separate them. So now I'm going to show you a picture of three little syllables. Ba, da, and ga, just for fun, just to highlight the difficulty. Why does digital noise reduction not work? Not that it's a bad thing, but why can it not increase speech recognition and noise? Why do we need directional mics? And we'll be talking about that in a bit, but here's three syllables. Ba, da, ga. Now, if I turn my face sideways, ba, I'm making with my lips. Da, I'm putting my tongue against the back of my front teeth. Da, da, on that ridge there. And ga, ga, I'm putting the, the back of my tongue up against the roof of my mouth. Okay? So one's the front, one's the middle, one's the back. They all have ah. Okay? But da, da, ga, front, middle, back, front, middle, back. And when you think about the nursery rhyme, patty cake, patty cake. Pataka, pa, front, middle, back, pataka, pataka. And that's why it's a good nursery rhyme for teaching kids to talk. Because it exercises all three places where you can constrict your face in making lip sounds or making speech. Front, middle, back, pataka, patty cake, patty cake. So when you think of these three little syllables, isn't that weird? All this shit, this is weird stuff. So watch this. Uh, uh, I'll share a screen here. Now look at these three syllables here. Ba. Da, ga. So ba is the one with the with your uh, lips. Da, tongue behind the ridge behind your front teeth. Ga, back of your tongue up against the roof of your mouth. Now, here's time. So each of these syllables takes like a, a third of a second to say. Ba, da, ga. Okay. And here's frequency, the vertical. And the orange bars indicate the resonances of your throat, the resonances of your face. So when you say these three syllables, ba, da, ga, look at the resonances are all at the same frequency, around 20, 2000, and the bottom resonance, all around about 500 hertz. So the, the resonances are the same. Now what makes them different? Well, the bottom ones are all identical. Look at that. The top ones, this little piggy's got a tail sticking down. This little piggy's tail is sticking up. And this little piggy's got none. So if what is so important about that? Well, if I played this, you know what you'd hear? That little, this little, you'd hear just a little chirp. Here's something else. Watch. If I took a little piece off of this. Took a little, see where my cursor is? I chopped that little point off right there. You'd still hear ba. If I chopped a little more off, played them together, you'd still hear ba. If I chopped a little bit more off of it, all of a sudden you'd hear da. You wouldn't hear the transition. And you know why you wouldn't hear the transition? Because you can't make a sound between ba and da. Go for it. Try it. It's either ba or da. You can't, bleh, bleh, we don't, bleh, it doesn't make any sense. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that a lot of what helps us tell what speech is, isn't only the sound. It's also the knowledge of where we know our tongue is in our mouth when we say those sounds.
It's just like me getting stopped by the cops for a DUI and they do the Romberg test. They say, close your eyes, put your hands out and see if you can touch your nose. Can you touch your nose? Okay. If I'm drunk, I'm going to be doing this. I'll miss. Okay. It's knowledge of where your, my limb is in space without me looking at it. And that's the same thing with your tongue. Knowledge of where your tongue would be in your face when you're hearing syllables. That helps you detect what the sound was. So all of this is a weird thing in speech perception. Don't freak. It's not at the end of the world. I'm never going to ask this on a test or exam. I'm just saying this is why digital noise reduction is hard to implement. Because how is it going to get rid of noise without at the same time throwing out these all important little tiny speech cues that tell you what the differences are. These are tiny little needles in a haystack. How are you going to have a digital noise reduction get rid of the noise without at the same time getting rid of these tiny but all important little speech cues? Here's another way of looking at the same thing. Here's speech in quiet. Here's a, just a, a different picture. Now imagine this as a mountain range. You can see a mountain range here, 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 and here. Okay, look at the red. That's the most intense. And those are low frequencies. This is speech. And the loudest parts of speech are the vowels. Okay, from the throat. <laughs> okay, so those are loudest. And notice those trees, those mountains are the tallest. And the softest parts of speech are the high frequencies, the consonants. There you go. Now what happened? Speech in noise. The floodwaters came in. Now the, now the valleys between the mountain ranges are flooded. Okay? So how are we going to expect a digital claw to come in there and separate and get rid of all the water without at the same time snapping down some of the trees? Do you see what I'm saying here? Whoops, I don't know why, the, what's the pause? Your desktop sharing is paused. Stop sharing, here you go. Okay, how is a digital claw supposed to go in there and remove the water without at the same time? That's why it's so hard to remove speech from noise from speech, because they are mixed. And if you remove the noise, you're necessarily gonna be removing some of the speech. It's like having a bowl of soup and then because you've stirred it all together, I'm saying, okay, now get rid of all the uh, carrot extract from the soup. Yeah, but it's all mixed with the peas and the beans. I mean, you can't. It's all mixed. So to get rid of one, you're necessarily going to be throwing out important stuff of the other. The whole purpose of this half an hour blather here that I've been doing is that removing background noise from speech is easier said than done. Okay, and that's why digital noise reduction that we talked about last week, its heart is in the right place, and it has an important role because it makes you feel better in noise. Yep, it reduces the gain, so it makes you feel less uncomfortable. The noise is loud, and the hearing aid automatically gets quieter. Oh, great. Yeah, good. That means I'm going to keep the hearing aids on, but does it increase the percent of words that I understand in noise? Heck no. Good. We are getting the important concept here. So now we've got to talk about D mics. What do directional mics do? Because they're different. And we said last week too, whoa, not that one. We said background noise is fairly steady in intensity over time, whereas speech has a lot more modulation. Okay, and it's that modulate, the word modulation means how much did the amplitude change over time? This doesn't have much modulation, this does. And that's how the hearing aid determines what's speech and what's noise, but it isn't always perfect because some background noises are really choppy and they'll look like this. And sometimes music, which you wanna hear, will have a long steady tone and the hearing aid will think it's noise. So there's always some mistakes, but eh, we couldn't, nah, let's not do it. So noise reduction with one channel. Remember, this is how we finished last week. And this isn't even last week's unit, but I'm just kind of reviewing some stuff. If you had noise reduction with one channel, and so the hearing aid went, oh, okay, this is entering my microphone. This is what, so it's probably noise. Reduce the gain. Well, then all you'd get 
is a gain reduction, the dotted line. Well, you might as well just have turned down your volume control. What's the difference? All you did was reduce the gain for everything. Did that separate speech from noise? Hell no. And then you've got a many channel hearing aid. Whereas each of these channels, these blue and red, blue and red, each of these channels has digital noise reduction. So each of those channels is going, hmm, is the sound coming in my mic like this? Or is the sound coming in my mic like this? So let's say you have a many channel digital hearing aid and these two channels are picking up noise, they're gonna drop. And these two channels are picking up steady state intensity sound, their noise drop. And these two channels pick it up and they drop. Well, doing this is better than doing this. Okay, here I've reduced the gain for everything. Here, I've reduced the gain only in certain channels, not all channels, because these channels here didn't pick up any noise, and these channels here didn't pick up any noise. So, but remember, whatever was in these channels that got dropped, it's the speech and the noise in those channels that got dropped. Because each channel has speech and noise in it, but if the channel gets dropped, it's going to drop for the noise, but also any speech inside of it's also going to go down. So anyway, look at this here. SS, speech, 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 speech. whoops, I got a little weird typo there. SS, speech sound that dropped. <laughs> anyway, so digital noise reduction does not at this time objectively, reliably, and statistically improve speech reception and background noise. Why? Because any channel that contains the sounds, if it decreases, it's decreasing the gain for both the noise in that channel and the speech in that channel. Digital noise reduction does improve subjective listening comfort in noise. That it does do. But on the other hand, if you could bring a, spe a hearing aid up to a person's lips, if I was able to take the hear, whoops, stop sharing. If I, whoa, if I had hearing aids on, the mic is over here, you're sitting over there. So you're talking to me and there's a bunch of noise that can interfere. But if I was able to take the microphone of the hearing aid and hold it up to you and you're talking into the mic, now it's right in front of you. And so I'm gonna be picking up all the sound from you. I'm not gonna have any problem hearing in the noise, okay? That's what I meant by if you could have a hearing aid brought up to the person's face, okay, then you're gonna have a lot better time hearing. So on that's why it says, on the other hand, if you can bring a hearing aid to the speaker's mouth, you increase the signal to noise ratio. Because now instead of me being a yard away from you, the microphone of my hearing aid is right by you. And so the distance is only a couple of inches. And so I'm going to be picking up a lot more of your voice. And that means I've increased the signal to noise ratio. And look what it says here. This does improve speech reception and background noise. So for example, D mics, directional mics, remote mics. Now I should ask you in clinic, are you at all fitting any hearing aids yet? Have you been doing any of that on the software? And have you been seeing some of the bundling with hearing aids at all? Like the pieces and parts that come with the hearing aid, like the telephone or television devices? Mm -hmm. Good. I've only seen that. I haven't done it myself. Okay, fair enough. But all of those are meant to increase signal to noise ratio. All of those. Okay, the devices that your hearing aid is using that work with your telephone, the devices the hearing aid is using that work with your television. So you can set a little thing beside the TV that's hooked up to the TV and it's sending the TV by Bluetooth to your hearing aids. So you're here picking up the sound of the TV and your hearing aids are delivering it to your ear. That way your TV doesn't have to be turned up. Anybody else in the room can hear it at a normal volume and you're getting the sound streamed through your hearing aids. That's increasing signal to noise ratio. All of these are. FM systems, increasing signal to noise ratio. Remote mics, if I could wear on, on my lapel a little mic, it's usually here, I'll pull a rock, <laughs> and the mic is usually about yay big, and I've got that clipped on my shirt, then the sound from my mouth is going into this, 
And it's way better than the sound from me having to cross the table going to you wearing the hearing aids. So the closer I can bring the mic of the hearing aid to me, the better off your signal to noise ratio is going to be. Anything that improves your signal to noise ratio is going to improve the percent of understanding of your speech. And that's objective. That's the real McCoy. Okay? Good. We got time to really flesh this out. As you say, Angela, we are ahead of time. So we're good. So, for example, D mics, remote mics, FM systems, all kinds of stuff that we can do. Now let's look at signal to noise ratio for a second. Let's just kind of check this out. SNR. And I think this is where we may end up finishing today. We'll just talk about SNR and then next week or whatever, I'll delve into directional mics. Okay, but I really wanted to kind of talk in an informal way, but really get people to realize what signal to noise ratios are. Here goes. SNR equals the level of the signal, in other words, the speech that you want to hear, compared to the level of competing background noise. So, for example, 70 dB of speech, whoa, 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 70 dB of speech in 60 dB of noise is a plus 10 signal to noise ratio. 60 dB of speech in 60 dB of noise is a 0 dB signal to noise ratio. 60 speech in 70 noise is a minus 10 signal to noise ratio. Got it? Good. Because pluses are good, minuses are bad. So here's typical face-to-face -face SNRs. People measured this. So watch this. When noise is 55 dB SPL, now what is, what is that? What's 55 dB SPL? Well, what's ambient background room noise? In a, if I'm sitting in this room here, or you're here over in that room there in Kansas City, if we're not talking, What's the, what's the intensity of sound hitting your ears? It's about 35 to 40 dB SPL. That's what ambient room noise is when no one's talking. Oh, you might hear a bit of traffic out there or something, you know, or the, the furnace turns on or whatever. But basically, when you're not talking, ambient room noise is about 35 to 40. So what's a whisper? If I'm whispering, it's about 50. What's average speech? 65. My father can beat your father at checkers. And my, your mother wears army boots. Yakety, 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 yak. I'm just yakking at you about 65 dB SPL. If I'm yelling, 80. Okay? So soft is about 55. Average is about 65. Loud is about 75, 80. So now let's go to that slide where we were. When background noise is around 55, in other words, a little bit, not bad, just a little bit of background noise in a room, people tend to speak at around 61. Because if there's barely any background noise, I'm not even going to talk very loudly. I've got nothing to compete against. So I'll be able to talk really softly. And this is what might happen in a nice, quiet room where two people are sharing a glass of beer and they're just talking. Yeah, there's no background noise. The music isn't on hardly. There's just this very easy listening situation. Well, then my, my SNR is going to be about five or six. So look at this. When the noise is 55, people tend to speak around 61. 61 minus 55 is about six. That's called easy peasy Japanesey. Okay? Now, when the noise increases to 65, Spoken speech also increases. It goes to about 68. So the noise signals to noise ratio here now is only three. That's harder. Still okay. It's, it's all right, but it gets a little harder. If the background noise increases to 75, speech also increases. But guess what? Not as much. So now you're at minus one signal to noise ratio. So in both the, in three of these situations, the noise went from 55 to 65 to 75, but spoken speech went from 61 to 68 to 74. 
So while the noise increased by 10 dB at each step, the speech did not increase by 10 dB at each step. The spoken speech here only increased by seven, and now the spoken speech only increased by about six. So it didn't keep up, and that's what makes, this is hard. So re, in all reality, if the signal to noise ratio is about zero, if the noise is 60 and the speech is 60, that's a zero dB signal to noise ratio. And for a normal hearing person, that's tough. It's kind of, you'll be, you'll be squinting and you'll get it, but it's, it's kind of hard. And you'll get probably 50% of the words if you can't see the person. So if you were unable to see the person and you could just hear the person's voice, so you couldn't use any visual cues, you probably get about 50% of the words said in a zero dB signal to noise situation. And that's gonna be very similar to what this last one showed you. The noise is 75, the speech 74, that's the same thing, that's basically a tough listening situation. So here's this slide and the next slide, and then we're done. For those with normal hearing, if the speech and noise are of similar intensity, you'll get about 50% of the speech, okay? The signal to noise ratios to get 50% may differ from lab to lab, but basically, if the signal to noise ratio is about zero, if the noise and the speech are even Steven, a normal hearing person is gonna understand about 50%. Now let's talk about mild to moderate sensory neural loss. Now, even though it's mild to moderate, the game has changed. I have 20 dB hearing in the low, sloping to about 50 decibel hearing loss in the highs. Average presbycusis, normal, normal, typical mild to moderate loss. That's what we mean by this slide here. Okay? and I want the stupid bar, go away, thank you. For mild to moderate sensory neural loss, however, an additional 5 dB SNR is required to get 50% of speech and noise. So whereas normal hearing, you had a zero dB signal to noise ratio, okay, and then you got 50%. For sensory neural loss, a 5 dB SNR, you'll get about 50%. So the magic number here is around 5. And Killian, now do you at all remember the name Killian? Okay, K-Amp. Okay, Mead Killian, big handlebar mustache. He's the guy that brought directional microphones back. Digital hearing aids introduce digital noise reduction. Widex Senso, 1997. And all the other companies were freaking. The sound of engineers crying. It sounds like the Tin Man, they get rusty, okay? All the little uh, plastic things with their, their pens in their pockets. The engineers were freaking. Because all oh, Widex is digital noise reduction. They got digital noise reduction, the sky is falling. Ah. The very next year, 1998, Killian came out with the D-mic and said, you know what, your digital noise reduction doesn't work. It may sound nice, may be comfortable, but do not be fooled that it's increasing the percent of words. Mm -mm, no research has shown that. And that's why he brought back directional mics. Directional mics had a renaissance, a rebirth. And he said, each additional decibel that you can improve SNR, he said that can result in up to 10% speech improvement. So every single decibel that you can squeeze out, if you can just make the SNR better by 1 dB, you can improve speech recognition by 10%. 20 dB, 20, uh, uh, 20%. I don't believe that. I think he was a little bit. So even if you improve the signal-to-noise ratio by 1 dB, let's say if it results in a 5% increase, we'll cut the 10 and a half. Still, if you can improve SNR by, say, 3 dB, you will have gotten a 15% improvement. 3 times 5 is 15, 15. That's not bad. Not too shabby. So this is the point. Every dB SNR that you can improve is a bonus. And so here we go. 
the signal-to-noise ratios for various degrees of hearing loss. You take the Parent Teachers Association, PTA, the Harper Valley PTA, okay? If your pure tone average is around 30, you might need a 4 dB signal-to-noise improvement to get 50%. If your pure tone average is around 40, you'll need about a 5 dB signal-to-noise ratio to get 50%. Remember the two slides here? If the normal hearing, 0 dB SNR on the bottom, you'll be able to understand 50% of speech. If you've got a mild to moderate loss, you'll need an additional 5 dB to get 50% of speech. So that's what this slide is talking about. So as your hearing gets worse and worse and worse, the required signal to noise ratio to get 50% of the speech also increases. And that is why directional mics are only helpful for people with a mild to moderate loss because directional mics cannot improve the signal to noise ratio by more than 5 dB. They can't. If a person has a worse hearing loss, he or she is going to need a lapel mic that I'm wearing. A directional mic on a hearing aid is a mic that focuses on one direction. And we'll talk about those next week and how those work. So that's the purpose of next week's talk is we'll go into how do directional microphones work. Suffice to say, directional microphones, you wouldn't even know if a hearing aid had a directional mic or not. It just looks like a little vampire hole. It's two little holes instead of one. So instead of having a little one little hole for the sound to go in, there's two. And we'll talk about why that is the case. But directional mics on a hearing aid are only good for a mild to moderate loss. If your loss is worse than that, you need more help to increase SNR. Because as we said here, the required SNRs are bigger. You start getting into bigger hearing losses, and you need more than 5 dB. And directional mics cannot improve the signal to noise ratio by more than about five. Now you're going to need FM system or lapel mics or other types of devices that will help you hear better in noise. Any questions? Good. All right. Got the same cool stuff hanging in the background there. You got a silver plate up there on the wall. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at this thing here. It's kind of like a great big old ear almost. It's just, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what that is. My cowboy hat? Oh, there it is. Yeah, you showed me that last week. Yeah, you see good my stuff. tree with the lights on it? Yeah, good one. <laughs> good, Angela. It's always good to talk every week. Thank so you. I will talk to Lynn Royer at uh, around 5.30. Yeah. And we'll find out and we'll get back to you about what's your, what your questions are. And let's get our act together. Okay. Yeah. Great. You guys do an awesome job, and I really appreciate both of you. Hey, hey. Okay. I'll stop recording here, and we'll see you when we look at you next week. Okie doke. Bye-bye. Okay. Oh, yeah, that too. Yep. <laughs>